Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Abhinav Verma, and he's going to talk about programmatically interpretable reinforcement learning. Thank you. As mentioned, I'll be talking about programmatically interpretable reinforcement learning, or PIRL for short. This is joint work with Vijay Raghavan Murli, Rishabh Singh, Pushmit Kohli, and Swarat Chaudhary. Many of the recent successes in reinforcement learning have been through deep learning models. This audience needs no introduction to deep learning wins, so I'll just mention three examples here. On the left, or rather on the right, uh, you have an agent learning how to play Atari games. In the middle, you have AlphaGo defeating Lee Sudol, one of the world champions at the game of Go. And on the right, you have an agent learning how to drive on a track. This last task requires continuous controls and brings us to our running example. To help illustrate the concepts and the ideas that we will be discussing in this talk today, I'd like to introduce you to the example of learning agents that drive in the environment of TORX. TORX is a car racing simulator. It gives us reading from 29 sensors, which basically describe the state of the environment. Agents control steering, steering and ac acceleration. And the goal, of course, is to complete laps as fast as possible without crashing. On the right, we have a TORX agent driving around a bend in a track. Before we discuss policies, programmatic policies, let's talk about policy representations. A policy is a map from sequences, sequences of states to actions. Essentially, uh, a policy is how an agent decides what actions to take. There are many ways to represent a policy. The two ways that we'll be talking about are neural policies and programmatic policies. Neural policies are represented by a deep neural network. Programmatic policies are represented by a descriptive program in a high-level language. Intuitively, this is the kind of program that you'd expect a human to write if you gave them a task. Basically, at a high level, a, a programmatic policy gives us more fine-grained information about the logic behind a program. For example, in the driving case, we might be able to infer the following information. Maybe the policy checks the car position, and if the car is near the center of the track, the policy increases the acceleration. If the car is not near the center of the track, it decreases acceleration. This kind of information can be witnessed while running a neural policy as well, but you, uh, it's extremely difficult to understand that logic just by looking at the neural network, whereas the programmatic policy, being a descriptive program, can give you this information easily. So the main idea behind this work is to automatically discover expressive policies in a high-level programming language. Our method to achieve this is to synthesize a programmatic policy with syntactic constraints that imitate a neural policy. Before we go into the details of, how we, uh, of our method, we'd like to, I'd like to discuss some significant benefits of programmatic policies. The first of these benefits is interpretability. DNNs are very hard to interpret. We know this because there's significant work in trying to interpret DNNs directly, significant research work, that is. Even then, it's extremely difficult to say at this point whether DNNs, DNNs will ever be as interpretable as descriptive programs in high-level languages. Programmatic policies, on the other hand, are by design interpretable. For example, here is a policy discovered by our method for acceleration. We can see that the policy first checks the track position sensor, and then based on that check, chooses one of two actions. And Looking at the actions, even without fully understanding what the P, I, and D stand for, we can get, kind of guess that because this has larger numbers, this branch increases the acceleration, whereas this branch decreases the acceleration. So we can see from here, and we'll go into this in more detail, that programmatic policies are more interpretable than deep neural networks. The second benefit is generalizability by which we mean how does the agent perform on similar but unseen environments. For example, can the, can the car drive on tracks that it has not been trained on? Neural policies often generalize poorly to even very similar environments. The essence of this problem was captured by Jacob Andreas in one of his tweets when he said, deep RL is popular because it's, on it's the only area in machine learning where it's socially acceptable to train on the test set. 
Now, of course, that's not the only reason that deep RL is popular, otherwise you wouldn't all be here, but programmatic policies are much more generalizable in general than uh, deep RL policies. And this is because they have a mechanism to systematically improve generalizability. This mechanism uses program sketches, which we will describe in detail later in the talk. Essentially, the sketch provides a way to seed the policy search with a desirable program structure. This gives us the ability to modify the learner's inductive bias and can be used as a regularizer to improve generalizability systematically. The third and final benefit that we'll be discussing is verifiability. By verifiability, we mean that we want to prove certain desirable properties of an agent. For example, we might want to prove that the driving agent does never accelerates above a certain threshold. DNNs being more low level are very hard to verify. For example, one of the latest state-of-the-art verifiers, ReluPlex, only verifies networks with ReLU activation functions and also places a bound of 300 nodes per layer uh, during verification. In contrast, program, programmatic policies can, be, can use more scalable program verification techniques, primarily because it's easier to verify them since they, since they represent the policy more compactly. But it's not all a garden of roses. One of the issues is that uh, of policy is the policy search challenge. Now all of RL deals with this issue. How do you search for a policy efficiently? But DRL is better at finding performant policies than many other methods, especially than finding programmatic policies directly. And there are two reasons for this. The first one is that the space of candidate programmatic policies is intractably large. It's of course uncountably infinite, but it's, it's also grow, it's, it's basically, uh, even, the, uh, stays, even the space of good programmatic policies is infinite, and the size of this, the dimensionality of this space grows exponentially the moment you consider even reasonably complex environments. The second issue is that DRL uh, techniques leverage gradient-based optimization. And we all know that gradient-based optimization is considerably better than discrete, well, it's not better, but it's usually more efficient than discrete optimization techniques. And programmatic policies define a highly non-smooth search space and therefore require discrete optimization techniques during policy search. So to sum up the comparison between neural versus programmatic policies, we have this following table. Deep neural networks or neural policies are not are harder to interpret, are harder to verify, and harder to generalize. But they're easier to learn, whereas programmatic policies are easier to interpret, easier to verify, easier to generalize, but they're extremely difficult to synthesize. So let's address the synthesis challenge that we've raised, or rather which we've encountered. The first challenge was the large search space. And this is, an, is a recognized problem in all of program synthesis. So the first, issue, first way to deal with this is to synthesize within a domain-specific language. So we need to put syntactic constraints on our search space. And one of the ways to do that is to use a domain-specific language instead of a general high-purpose programming language like Python or Java. The second way we do this is to use a sketch or program skeleton as a guide during synthesis. The second issue of optimization is dealt with by imitating a neural policy during synthesis. This imitation gives us a pseudo gradient, which provides a me mechanism to reduce the dependence on discrete optimization. Now let's jump into some of the details of this, the technical details of this work. At the very highest level, the PyRL framework is the aim of the PyRL framework is to find a POMDP policy that can be syntactically represented by a program that fits the sketch. More formally, a policy for us is a map from sets of histories to actions. The policy reward is given by this expression. It's the expected, it's the expected aggregate reward. And our goal is to find a program E such that it maximizes the expected ag aggregate reward associated with, that, with the corresponding policy. But E has to come from the set S defined by the sketch. We talked about putting syntactic constraints, so let's talk about the domain-specific language which introduces these syntactic constraints. Our DSL is a stream, stream processing language, which since our policies are maps from sequences of states to actions. The DSL uses map, fold, and filter, which are standard higher-order higher combinators over sequences. 
This DSL follows the functional programming paradigm because this helps in representing expressions compactly while not sacrificing on the range of expressions expressible in the DSL. Next, we come to a sketch. As we mentioned, PyRL requires a domain-specific sketch for candidate programmatic policies. At a high level, the sketch gives the following information. Our programs should look like this. They should be an if statement, possibly nested if statements, and at the end, each if statement should branch into two PID-like controllers. So these policies are, very, are basically like what we saw at the very beginning, but this is the sketch, so it gives this sort of out, outward structure of the type of policies we look at. The sketch does not give us which sensors to look at, the values of parameters, and more, more fine-grained information like that. Formally, the sketch looks like this. It's, it, it's given as a grammar, which constrains the set that uh, is defined by the DSL grammar. Now we'll talk about the algorithm to synthesize programmatic policies. This algorithm is called Neurally Directed Program Search, or NDPS. At a high level, this is how the, program, the algorithm works. We start with a neural poli policy oracle. The neural policy oracle gives us a labeled input-output set which we give to the program synthesizer along with a sketch. We run a simulation with the programmatic policy given by the synthesizer. In the first step, we can, uh, we can uh, ignore the reward improves question because that's, always, that's yes for us. Now, during the simulation, we collect all the bad states. These are states in which the programmatic policy behaves suboptimally. And we give these bad states back to the neural policy oracle. The neural policy oracle then again labels these bad states with corresponding good actions and adds it to the labeled input-output set. This process is followed till the reward of the iteratively generated programmatic policy no longer improves. At that point, we give that pro the final programmatic policy as the output to our, of our algorithm. Now we'll show you a quick demonstration of of uh, DRL of agents on talks. This is the DRL agent. On the right, you have the actions. And the DRL agent, as you can see, takes pretty unsmooth, jerky actions. This is, whereas the end, and these are on the training tracks. The NDPS agent, it's slightly slower, but it takes smoother actions all along the track. And it completes laps as well. Now this is on an unseen track or a transfer track. And this is the DRL agent. Again, it's taking jerky actions. And finally, it loses control and crashes and never recovers from the crash. Whereas the NDPS agent drives smoothly and, as we'll soon see, completes the track without crashing and gets a reward and lap time on this race. So talking about uh, some of the evaluations, here's performance on training tracks. Um, these are two tracks on which we've trained both agents. As we can see, the deep uh, uh, reinforcement learning agent is faster than the NDPS agent. This is not entirely unexpected since we are using the DRL agent as a teacher or as an oracle. So the best we can really hope for here is to match its performance. We also performed experiments with variations of the NDPS agent, uh, details of which are in the paper. Now we have the performance on unseen tracks or generalizability. And here we can see what we witnessed in the video. The DRL agent crashes and is unable to complete the race, whereas the NDPS agent can completes the race and has reasonable time, uh, lap time in the race. This shows us essentially that the NDPS is far better at generalizability than the, than the DRL agent. Finally, formally verifying desirable behavior. We've shown that we can formally verify certain properties of the NDPS agent. The first property we prove is that it has universal brown bounds. Essentially, this means that assuming certain reasonable bounds on the inputs, we can prove certain bounds on the outputs, the outputs here being steering and acceleration. We use off-the-shelf program verification tools to uh, prove these properties. We also prove a smoothness property, which formally proves the type of behavior that we witnessed in the smooth behavior that we witnessed in the video. Our DRL network for talks uses the TANH activation function and has up to 600 nodes per layer. To the best of our knowledge, there is no tool to formally verify such a network. In summary, here are the main contributions of our work. Firstly, we introduced our RL framework called PyRL. 
the framework is designed to generate interpretable, generalizable, and verifiable policies. Next, we designed a domain-specific language for the PyRL framework. This the domain-specific language can, is a functional programming language with combinators that represents policies efficiently and compactly. Thirdly, we introduced the use of program sketches to provide a mechanism to systematically integrate domain knowledge into the learning process. Finally, we presented an algorithm called Neurally Directed Program Search that synthesizes programmatic policies for reasonably complex RL environments. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. If you have questions, please uh, come to the microphones. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, do you limit the depth of the nested if statement in your sketch program to limit the complexity of the programmatic policy you get at the end? Uh, so as an implementation detail, uh, the algorithm uh, is biased towards smaller uh, programs. So we don't um, forcefully um, sort of put an artificial limit, but uh, the way these programs are generated, they're generated through a, a probabilistic model. Um, and so that the probability of generating longer and longer programs falls sort of exponentially. All right, thanks. So for the DSL you specified here, the, yeah, that's specified, that's specific for the wasting game or it's uh, kind of like a general framework, general description language for any kind of game? So the, dom the DSL is general for the PyRL framework. So we feel that this is a general enough DSL that it should work with a very wide variety of environments. Um, the sketch is domain specific. So it's, so for each, so if you change from the talks environment to a different environment, we expect that you might have to give a different sketch. Um, this sketch is, uh, uh, uses PID controllers, which are known to work well for controlling car uh, steering and acceleration. But if your task was considerably different, then you'd have to give a different sketch. Um, but the overall framework of the DSL is supposed to be general enough to capture all kinds of environments. OK, thanks. Uh, so you, you mentioned earlier that you can give uh, guarantees. How can you, uh, or how do you work with stochastic environments or sensor noise or all kinds of uncertainties? So um, that's a, a great question because that's really future work. Um, right now, we are focused on um, is focused on environments which give us uh, complete information in terms of the state. Um, but if we have uh, in environments which give us uh, which have the stochastic uh, stochastic uh, variabilities, then we'd have to use verification techniques that work with that, those kind of uh, programs. So basically, in those kind of situations, we'd have to have a DSL which has primitives which deal with pro pro probabilistic uh, um, prim uh, algorithmic uh, types, and then program verification techniques for those kind of types would have to be used. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this talk. Thank you. So the next talk is by Roland Hafner on learning by playing, solving sparse reward tasks from scratch. So hello everybody, thanks for coming. My name is Roland Hafner and today I'm happy to present our paper Learning by Playing, Solving Sparse Rewards Tasks from Scratch on behalf of Martin Riemiller, myself and the great people on the slide here. So we see manipulation tasks as a great testbed for all kinds of machine learning and artificial intelligence methods. First, because Manipulation is grounded in the real world, so uh, if we solve manipulation problems, we can also test our solutions in the real world and see how good they are in reality. Second, because manipulation tasks can have really hard and complex problems that require a combination of both, on the one hand side, 
uh, really precise and good uh, feedback, dynamic feedback control to be dexterous to handle the objects. On the other hand side, uh, it requires really long horizon or kind of planning to solve complex manipulation problems. So, for example, consider a problem like this. Uh, we have a six joint uh, robotic single manipulator with three finger joints and we expect it to put two objects that are randomly positioned on the ground on this table here in that box uh, that has a lid. So in our setting, this would require to compute 360 correct actions for a nine-dimensional space, uh, which would be 18 se a sequence of 18 seconds to solve the task. So the main question now is, how can we solve these complex manipulation tasks in a general way? Uh, general for us means here that we want to reduce the prior knowledge we put in the solution or in the learning method so that we can apply this learning method and solution to a wide variety of uh, manipulation tasks. So our method of choice is to formulate these problems as, as a feedback control problem and solve it with reinforcement learning. So for reinforcement learning, a problem like this is already really hard. To make it worse, at least for the algorithms, uh, we pose two additional requirements. So we, want to, we don't want to use uh, shaping rewards because in these settings this gets really complex, error prone and maybe not even possible. Uh, what we want to use are just sparse rewards. So in this example uh, the agent would ju just get a one if the bricks are in the box in every other state in the state space the agent would get a zero. So we want to tell the agent what to do not how to do it. And the second requirement we want to put is that we want to learn from scratch. So we don't want to use any human demonstration, any pre-training, or any curriculum states that could be really difficult to uh, acquire in the real world. So we think that this method is really general and uh, powerful to solve these tasks. But what we're left with is a really difficult exploration problem. So it's obvious in this example, with uh, just a greedy, uh, epsilon greedy exploration, it will never get a single reward signal both objects in the box. So how to overcome this exploration problem? Uh, on the left hand side you see how learning should look like. So kids and, and babies learn manipulation mainly by rich interaction with their environment. So while playing they will start just by mainly randomly moving their limbs in a very early stage. Uh, then they will see, okay, if I touch something, oh this feels good. Uh, so I learned to touch objects, and while touching objects, they will see, ah, I can move an object, that looks also good. So step by step, they will learn to maybe to stack objects, to build a castle, or uh, to solve really complex tasks. The question now uh, in our work was, how can we bring this playful experience and playful uh, interaction with the environment to our reinforcement learning setting? So if we only have a sparse rewards task, uh, and, and um, if we only had a sparse rewards task, then obviously an agent starting from uh, initial state distribution x0 using only uh, epsilon greedy exploration will just explore a very, very small part of the state space. So for more complex problems, it will never see any reward, and so it will never solve, learn to solve the task. This is obviously not what kids and baby do while playing. The first, first idea now is to add a set of auxiliary tasks. These auxiliary tasks in the moment are hand designed, uh, but we think that, or we, we expect them to be very simple to define, so we use sparse reward signals as well, and we want them to be very general, so we think we can find a set that is, uh, that is useful for, for a wide uh, spectrum of, of manipulation tasks to solve. Now, the agent should not only Try, uh, use this, this uh, auxiliary task for learning, it should also follow these auxiliary tasks. And while following these auxiliary tasks, it will explore the state space and it will have a better exploration. So for example, in this uh, experiment, just using some uh, epsilon, epsilon greedy exploration, it would learn maybe, so it would see some move and some touch uh, examples and reward signals, will learn it, and afterwards, uh, it will try to move and touch and may see some other uh, reward signals to learn that. So the idea now is how can we make this 
general exploration scheme more powerful so that we even can learn this goal state, uh, this goal task. So to be a more a bit technical, uh, in our algorithm now, instead of having just one reward signal and one task, we have now a set T of tasks or intentions, how we call them, that is, uh, that is built from the, the one main task that we want to solve, one or more main tasks, and a set of auxiliary tasks, AI, that are hand-defined, as I explained. Now, in every step in the control, uh, the agent will execute its policy, P, that is conditioned not only on the state, but now also on the intention I want to follow in that point in time. So in the next step, then, the, uh, the, the agent will re receive a next state and also the reward signal for, for all the intentions we have. Now, our main objective is that we want to learn all in, of the intentions that we have in parallel. So we want to find a parameter theta for the task condition policy, pi, that optimizes the joint object objective of the main task and all of the auxiliary tasks. So one main ingredient of the algorithm now is to use off-policy reinforcement learning. Why off-policy reinforcement learning? Because we can share the transitions between the intentions when they was, were executed. So for example, if I sample the transition SAS prime under uh, intention B, then I can put this in my replay buffer, and I, when I recall it to update my policy on my Q function, then I can update this Q function and policy not only for B, but for all intentions in our intention set. So what does that mean? Uh, suppose we, uh, we have a policy, and I follow a policy or, uh, to, to solve A3, and uh, take this trajectory in the region of A3, but we cross the region of A1 here. So we have all the transitions of this policy in our replay buffer, and now we can use these transitions to update the policy for A1 as well. But not only can learn this, but still, the, the policy for A1 will try to learn the optimal solution that may look completely different. So it's just for exploration. So exploring the state space by executing the, the auxiliaries is one main ingredient. The second main ingredient here is not only to execute one of the intentions per episode, because then the coverage of the state space will just be some larger region around the initial distribution x0. So in our paper, we, uh, had, we proposed to use, for example, just as a proof of concept, two intentions per episode. So uh, we start with one intention, execute this intention for a certain number of steps, and then we made a new decision what intention to execute now. Then the, the decision what intention to execute is made by a scheduler, how we call it. And the simple scheduler can come up with is just a random, uniform random uh, scheduler that we call SACU uh, for uniform, and that we use as a baseline in the paper mainly. This SACU does an amazing good job already, so it's hard to beat it. But the main idea is also visualized here. So uh, we follow uh, uh, A3 to reach the region of A3, and then we randomly, sorry, we randomly uh, switch to uh, reach A2, uh, the trajectory from A3 to A2 may cross some other uh, interesting region where we see reward, and so we can also learn this region, and if we are uh, lucky enough, this is also the main task we want to solve. So this, al this case gives us already a very good exploration of the state space. Another piece in the paper was then the final ingredient for our algorithm, to uh, use a better scheduler. So obviously, just drawing random in intentions that, that I want to execute with a real system is not very, it's very expensive. So uh, you will waste a lot of interactions that you made with intentions you already learned, or that, that, and that are not very useful to collect more uh, reward and to, to explore more. So the main idea here is to learn a Q function in the scheduler that tries to, to predict 
for each of the main tasks that we have, the accumulated reward that we will collect following a sequence of intentions. So for example here, uh, for uh, this trajectory, uh, this combination of intentions, it would say, okay, you, uh, you get no reward with respect to the main task. For the blue trajectory here, it would say, okay, you get uh, some reward here, and it's better to follow this. As to learn this Q function, the, uh, as to learn this Q function, we have to adapt very fast because the underlying distribution that is given by the policies is changing also, also fast. In the paper, we propose to just use a tabular Monte Carlo approximation of this distribution. And finally, then just we can draw from this distribution and, and, uh, and execute these intention combinations that will give us some reward that and that will give, give us a much better exploration. So here are some additional details from, the, from our algorithm. In principle, we use a distributed setup that runs everything asynchronous. So we have five different processes, types of processes running. The first type is the actor that executes the policy and interacts with the environment. Then we have a replay buffer where all the transitions are sto stored with a, a vectorial reward from all the intentions. Then we have a sampler that samples uh, transitions and shares the transition between these intentions. And a standard off policy learner that takes the transitions and updates the parameters for the policy. In addition, we have here a remover to just keep the replay buffer uh, uh, below a maximum size. For the paper, for the paper results, we have 36 actors and 36 learners, but we have also more recent results to, uh, to reduce this to one actor and one learner for uh, tasks. For network structure, we use uh, shared layers at the beginning, all the with the convolutional network and layer norm, and then heads for each of the intentions uh, that we, uh, also makes learning faster and more efficient. So here are some experiments. We had a couple of experiments in the paper. Uh, this is a basic experiment where we have 13 auxiliary tasks. For example, one is touch, no touch, move. We would just minimize or maximize uh, the readings of sensor. Then we have relational rewards like close, above, below. And then we have two extrinsic tasks like stack the red on the green or green on a red one and we do the, th the whole experiment on a, on a large workspace with the raw joint ex action for uh, the robot. We compared just uh, without auxiliary task and offline learning policy to the just flat lines. We compared it against uh, an intentional and unintentional agent that has the same auxiliaries but that doesn't execute them. It takes off very late. And we run the SEC-U and SEC-Q uh, algorithm that is good in this, in this uh, ex ex basic experiment. And also we did some experiments from Pixel just as a proof of concept that it works, which also works in this, in this case. So here's an advanced experiment. So we have two blocks again, the, the arm, and want to put two blocks in the box. So we have 15 auxiliary rewards, the same, but just for the new object, a few more. We have six extrinsic tasks now, so open box, inbox one, two, inbox all, and stack the two bricks from before. We also do the comparison, and now the, the story is different. So IU and DDPG flat lines here completely. The, U, the random uniform scheduler takes off very late, and the SEQ learns all of the intentions uh, in a very data efficient way. So keep in mind that the SEC uh, algorithms not only learned the, the target uh, experiment that we, that we showed and compared, but it learned all 15 auxiliary intentions and all of the six main intentions we wanted to learn. So here are just a few examples. So it all starts with a random uh, policy. Then it try, uh, starts to, to see some rewards for touch and move. So it learns touch and move. Then the next step, it uh, learns something like left close and right close, what's also in our auxiliary set. So it puts the, the red one on the right side and now the green one on the right side of the left, maybe. In the next step, then it learns some, can learn something like stack the red on the green one, but also stack the green one on the red one, which was not an initial uh, state distribution 
that we gave on the episode begin, so that works. And in the final stage, it can also learn uh, one single policy that does the put both breaks in the box task, box task. And also, it can do it if you just command uh, put red on green and then put them in the box with a completely different policy, as you can see now. So we did some other experiments, uh, a lot of other experiments. Here some, are some examples. In the paper, we had also the experiments for the real robots. So they are a bit simplified, just to save time, experimentation time. So we have Cartesian control and a few shaping uh, auxiliaries allowed. We can learn something like lift and bring with a few auxiliaries here. And we can learn this in 10 to 12 hours of real robot interaction time. That's really data efficient and really, really nice. So here are some other examples. So uh, here we try to, to make the, the, the experiments we had in the paper also the full experiments with the real robots. So here's some stacking attempts. Sorry. Uh, we try to, uh, to apply this SAC agent also for other domains. Here's, some, here's a double card pull system uh, where it controls the pole in all possible equilibrium points. Here's more like a fun uh, project where we tried if it can stack a box on a round banana-shaped object, on a round thing. So it has to be very dexterous here. And we try also to, to work with all kinds of different objects and more objects to make it really, really efficient for manipulation. So as a conclusion, uh, we propose this learning by playing uh, and propose this algorithm, that the, the scheduled auxiliary control to solve this complex manipulation task from scratch and sparse reward. Uh, it's important to execute this auxiliary task, that's one take home matrix. It's important to have a sequence of these auxiliary tasks in your ep uh, episode, that's another take home message. And the scheduling of these intentions make your data efficient. Maybe data efficient enough uh, if you use a good scheduler that you can also learn on the real robot. If you want to hear more about this work and chat, uh, we have a poster number 41. Uh, and yeah, thanks. Okay, questions please. Oh, very interesting work. This is just a clarification question. So the auxiliary task is basically to break a big task into multiple sequences of smaller tasks, right? Uh, so it differs here from the hierarchical reinforcement learning setup. Uh, it's only a small difference, but it's important. Uh, the final policy will not use any other policy from other tasks that were learned. So the, the auxiliaries are only for exploration and to, to draw more samples that may be useful to optimize another policy that is more complex. Thank you. Uh, Follow-up question is, how do you choose uh, good auxiliary tasks? <laughs> That's, that's a very good question. So our, our holy grail would be to detect these intentions and, and to have something like intrinsic intentions that can be even learned, maybe. Uh, in the moment we, we uh, hand design them, we think that they are really, that they are quite general, but uh, they are hand designed. And yeah, you, you, have, to ha you have to have some, some good uh, sense of what's a good auxiliary to design them. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. I, <coughs> uh, thanks for the excellent talk. And uh, uh, we know that epsilon greedy uh, strategy, like epsilon greedy, is very inefficient in exploration. And have you compared with other more sophisticated uh, exploration tricks like uh, like uh, curiosity-based intrinsic reward, or something like that? That's a very good question. So uh, there are many exploration schemes that are way better than epsilon greedy. Uh, we think that we only tested epsilon greedy in the moment because that's our standard. Uh, we don't think that other exploration schemes are powerful enough to solve these complex tasks, but they will do better. Uh, we want to explore some of, the, of some of them, and we also are working on this uh, no reward learning scheme in this direction at least, yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks, uh, Roland. And now Carlos is setting up.
Um, so the next talk is on automatic goal generation for reinforcement learning agents, and Carlos Florenza is going to present this. Yeah, good afternoon. So I'll be presenting um, this work done in collaboration with uh, David, uh, Young, and Peter on efficient training of multitask policies via curriculum. So the, the main objective is to efficiently train a policy to achieve all possible goals upon demand. So to get, have a high-level idea in navigation, we may want to um, ask our agent here in this maze to go to one end of the maze or to another end of the maze. In manipulation, we, we may ask the robot to place uh, an object in a certain configuration or in another certain configuration. Or in general, we can understand goals as reaching any desired end state, for example, having a cup of coffee. We would like our algorithm to discover all feasible goals um, and have minimal engineering. As Roland was saying before, this implies having uh, to deal with sparse rewards. At the same time, be efficient uh, uh, in a way that it focuses on goals that uh, currently give better learning signal for the agent. All these will be handled by our automatic curriculum uh, approach. Let's, let's uh, give a little bit of definitions so that we can all follow uh, better. What is a goal? In my case, it will be just a goal in a goal space that describes a subset of uh, the state space. A very simple example of this would be that the goal lives in the state space itself. So this would be like a simple illustration. And in this case, it would be very easy to define these um, uh, states um, by simply a, a metric in this. But this is not needed for a framework. This is just an illustration. And this will be like the set of uh, states uh, that this goal is describing. What reward uh, should we get for reaching this goal? Well, it, it should be just the sparse reward of whenever the agent enters the goal. So the agent goes around in the environment, and whenever it gets inside the state, it gets a reward. And the objective to, to optimize for is what we call uh, coverage, which simply introduces this expectation over a uh, distribution of feasible or interesting goals that is uh, fixed, given to us. And here is the return of our uh, policy in, uh, when it's trying to reach the state uh, the, defined by, by this goal. So the challenge is that training directly in this goal distribution is not efficient because many goals may be unfeasible or too hard for the current policy. At the same time, other goals uh, might already be mastered by the current policy, so we don't need to train on this any, uh, anymore. And also solving some goals might help in solving some other goals later on. So instead of training on the, uh, the original probability distribution, we train on these goals of intermediate difficulty that we define as the ones that the current policy has a return in between some bounds. In our all experiments, we choose like between 10% and 90% success probability. Uh, and this generates an automatic curriculum as has already shown in some previous work. So an overview of the algorithm would be, first we sample, we have these um, goals of intermediate difficulty and we sample from them. And then we train, for example, using uh, TRPO in our case, which means the agent uh, tries to reach one goal and then uh, tries to reach another goal, sometimes succeeds or not. Then now we use all the paths that were uh, collected through TRPO to label the goals. For example, this one that we always reach consistently, it will be a high reward goal now. And that one that we sometimes but don't always will be a goal of intermediate difficulty. So we want more of those. And now we will use all the trajectories that were already collected to TR with TRPO to label all this, and we'll feed a generative model to these new distributions and we iterate through this procedure. To feed the goal distribution, uh, it may be very complex, so we decided to use a very expressive generative model, in particular a uh, GAN. Uh, this is the equation, the usual equation of the GAN, but also we don't have many positive examples, the ones that were built before. Uh, so we also wanted to use the negatives, so we introduced a little modification that says, uh, to the objective that we don't want to generate those anymore. Uh, the research questions that we're going to try to answer are whether this goal GAN that I just introduced just reliably tracks these goals of intermediate difficulty, so if it tracks the performance of the agent, whether this improves the, the learning speed on the uh, coverage objective, and whether this extends to higher dimensional goal spaces. The first experiments were with ant maze, so the ant is trying to uh, arrive to all possible goals in the maze. So in an early stage of the learning, it might be very good at reaching um, nearby where it starts in this lower branch of the maze, but later, but the points that are on other sides of the maze might be too hard to reach. And our 
generative model correctly samples very heavily on this region where it still uh, it, it needs to do most learning and it doesn't sample from points that are further down and that are just too hard to reach right now. As learning proceeds, the agent learns how to do all the first stretch of the maze and our al uh, algorithm focuses now the training on these U-turn that it has to learn to do, and further on in the training, when it already knows how to do the U-turn, it, it samples uh, the points from the end of the maze. Uh, just to know that standard RL methods cannot reach the other side of the maze if you just train on that single goal, whereas this uh, curriculum does help you. Good, this is another uh, experiment that, that really makes shine the, the, uh, this um, uh, goal GAN procedure. In this case, the free and just wants to reach every single point around it. And you can see that the, the, the points that are of intermediate difficulty have really uh, complex shapes. In this case, it's a, it's a circle, and uh, our goal GAN is able to feed that pretty accurately. We do have faster convergence that some of the baselines that are uniformly sample of goals, uh, that is the green line or the reward shaping that is the one that doesn't take off really struggles. Um, and we do better than other goal generation methods that we compare to. Uh, in higher dimensions, we also try that by increasing the dimension of the point mass, and we go up to six dimensions in the goal space without really losing any efficiency. So uh, with this, I really want to thank my collaborators, and if you have any further questions, come see me at poster 135. Thank you. Oh, he's not coming for a question, sorry. Okay. Um, so what happens if, if there are goals that you actually can't reach very easily, which never show up in this intermediate uh, goal set? Yeah, th this is a good point. So there's, there's several things. There's goals that might just be unfeasible, for example, uh, crossing a wall in a maze. And then in this case, you will, you will never, you, like, you will never sample from them because you never had these like reaching them sometimes, but not always. But it's true that the whole method is, is you know, this is uh, based on continuous space of goals. So you will be pushing the boundary of, your, of, of the goals that you can reach. And hence, if you have like goal spaces that are completely disconnected, this method might struggle because as, as you might guess, like you have never observed a goal in that one space. So it does rely on these like continuous of uh, goal spaces. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so one thing that I also didn't quite understand, uh, so you said in this um, spider maze thing that you can't actually solve this with normal reinforcement learning, so why is that? Well, I mean, like, for sure if you throw enough data, it probably you can solve it, but like in the, so with the same um, uh, batch size, for example, TRPO is not able to solve it. I actually give a reference um, here. The, these, these references, I mean, you tried it in 2016, but the algorithm hasn't changed, like TRPO is still TRPO. So with, the, with the, the same batch size or even increasing the batch size, uh, it just like, it never manages to, like the ant literally has to walk all the way to the other end of the maze to observe the reward. So if, uh, if you never observe this in the first place, any reinforcement learning method that is not relying in some kind of intrinsic motivation will just never take off because you never observe the reward. So this is the case where there's only one reward at the other end of the maze. And I'm saying, like, now that given that you have a curriculum, um, you, like, the task is actually harder because you're learning to get everywhere, not only to the last point, but just as a side comment, you can also get uh, to, the, to the other end, even though only training on that doesn't get you there. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Carlos. And so you are the last speaker of this session. That's so good. Um, our next speaker is Aravind Srinivas, and he's going to talk about universal planning networks, um, learning generalizable representations for visual motor control. Uh, so I'll be talking about universal planning networks. This is joint work with Alan Jabri, Peter Abil, Sergey Levin, and Chelsea Finn. So we've seen a lot of successes in using reinforcement learning for simulated environments like Atari games, Mijoko, uh, Go, and Dota. However, conventional deep RL methods have tried to use representation learning as part of the RL problem uh, due to the availability of well-defined reward functions such as the score on a game console. 
in real world, agents don't get score like rewards. So you see, if you want an agent to pour water from a jar onto a glass, uh, it's hard to have rewards like the level of water in the jar and the glass at the moment. Thus, it would actually help us to tackle the control problem after having acquired the right representation. So if we have a representation that has understood the notion of goal-based planning, uh, we can use that representation to provide rewards to optimize a sequence of actions to achieve a given target image. So uh, the problem with, uh, let me describe the problem with pixel level objectives for goal-based planning. If we had a reward that just tried to match the final image pixels with the goal image pixels, it would be extremely sparse to optimize an oral agent. And rewards that try to minimize the distance between the goal and the final image, either at the pixel level or at the uh, state level, which is where the state is obtained through reconstruction errors, cannot distinguish between task relevant and task irrelevant properties of the goal image. So therefore, representation learning targeted for visual motor control and planning is an important problem to figure out. What are the properties that we desire in the uh, visual motor representations? One, we want planable representations. That is, representations explicitly optimized to support planning uh, goal-directed behavior. We want representations that can generalize. And we want representations to optimize directly for what you care about. More on this later. So the key idea in our paper is to optimize for representations that support planning. So we propose an architecture, UPN, that learns planable representations. In order to learn planable representations, we learn representations such that if you run a gradient descent planner on it, the resulting plan should be optimal. And the way we validate that the plan should be optimal is using a behavior cloning loss in the outer loop, using the optimal plan that is available with an expert trajectory. So this way, we can not only imitate very effectively, but we can also learn representations that can be useful down the line, for instance, for uh, providing reward functions for goal-based planning in uh, re related with your motor tasks. So I'll explain the policy architecture. I'll show how it can offer planability. And I'll show how you can use reward functions from it. And I'll show you the experiments that support all these hypotheses. So universal planning networks architecture. You have an initial image, you encode it into a latent state. You have a goal image, same encoder, latent goal. You start with a randomly initialized plan. You unroll the plan using a forward model in the latent state. You imagine the future latent state, compare it with the latent state of the goal, compute this reward metric in the embedding space, and backpropagate this embedding uh, space metric onto the plan. So you improve the plan this way by multiple steps of gradient descent trajectory optimization. This whole process leads to chaining multiple gradient descent steps in sequence. After I iterations of gradient descent trajectory optimization, you want to make sure that the improved plan is actually optimal as far as the task is concerned. And this, bl this block is the gradient descent planner in the UPN. And the way we ensure it's optimal is using behavior cloning in the outer loop. It's backpropagated through the entire uh, uh, planning process. It's surprising that we can actually backpropagate through several gradient descent steps. It's a very long computation graph. So this way, the Im image embedding and the forward model that we learn are purely trained to optimize for task performance and not for intermediate objectives such as reconstruction errors or forward prediction errors. This is what I said by optimizing directly for what you care about. So in summary, we propose the policy architecture with gradient descent trajectory optimization. Next, I'll show you uh, why it can lead to better generalization and what the learned metric in the task-specific abstraction can help with. So here are our experiments. Can UPN learn effective visual imitation policies in compar comparison to conventional policy architectures? It turns, so the tasks that we use to study imitation are uh, having a point robot to move around different, uh, up, different goal locations in, uh, by ignoring the distractors and generalizing across obstacle structures, and having a three-link reach around match a, the goal pose, generalizing across obstacle structures. So the y-axis is test success, x-axis is the number of demonstrations, red is the UPN curve, we have baselines as recurrent and uh, feed-forward goal conditional policy architectures and value iteration network. 
We see that UPN is more sample efficient for test set generalization. However, with a sufficient number of training demonstrations, uh, these baselines can catch up with UPN. So the more interesting question is, can, what can the extracted generalization be useful for as far as UPN is concerned? Remember, we optimize explicitly for planability. So how can we exploit it at test time further? So here is a curve. So the bottom horizontal line was the UPN with 40 planning steps and 20,000 demonstrations. Y-axis test success, X-axis is the number of planning steps. And the top horizontal line is UPN with 40 planning steps, but 20 to 40,000 demonstrations. And this particular brown curve is if you vary the number of planning steps for a UPN that was trained with just 20,000 demonstrations. This clearly shows that planning more at test time helps, even if the architecture was trained for fewer planning steps and with fewer demonstrations. Therefore, it's clear that the gradient descent optimizer we've learned has captured task-relevant properties. Can we go beyond imitation? So recall this was the gradient descent planner. And recall that this was the planning metric or the reward metric that's being learned in the embedding space. In relying on minimizing latent distance to goal for planning, UPN learns a task-related and optimizable distance metric. So here is a visualization of the distance metric. Dark blue is smaller, light blue larger. It's clear that uh, these are for different end effector positions with respect to the shown end effector position. The UPN distance metric is obstacle aware as opposed to traditional Euclidean-based distance metrics, which would have been concentric circles. So can we do reinforcement learning using UPN representations that were obtained using training task demonstrations, but use the metric that we learned to provide reward functions for model-free RL on harder with your motor control tasks? So you have three unfolding creatures here. You, they provide your demonstrations, and then you learn the encoder. And you use that metric from the encoder to train a filing creature, which is a harder task, a different robot. So it shows that the encoder learns a task-specific semantic that can be transferred across different robots. The same technique can be used to train UPN representations on point robots and control a much more complex four-legged quadruped. We could also see transfer to much longer horizon tasks using the same technique or controlling a much more complicated robot, such as a full humanoid, uh, to change directions. So effectively, we showed a new policy architecture for goal-directed imitation. We learned planable representations to transfer task-related semantics. And we've shown that planability is an important criterion to have for generalizable visual motor control. Yeah, I, I'm ready to take some questions. And check out the poster at Hall B106. Thanks. Taking, while we're taking questions, maybe the next speaker can already come up. Uh, okay, so can you maybe give a very quick uh, like insight? What is your forward model? How do you learn it? How do you decide on the latent state dimensions and so on and so forth? Basically, everything that's about the dynamical system you're learning there. Mm -hmm. So the forward model here is not learning a typical uh, one step ahead prediction error. So it's just controlled over time. And uh, you're just learning everything using a behavior cloning objective in the outer loop. So uh, it, it's, kind of, it's, not, it's, it's just used for planning, but not used for typical dynamics prediction. You're using a, what you call a gradient descent based planner. Uh -huh. And uh, so as an AI person, I'm, I'm uh, I'm, I'm reacting to the idea that you could do planning by gradient descent. Uh -huh. uh, we would normally think that's, uh, that's a very limited kind of plan you're forming if you can, you can just do it without search. Planning involved requires search, and there's no way you can do it by gradient descent. That's what we would think. Um, so gradient descent is one way to make the whole uh, planning process differentiable. So let's say you had a Monte Carlo tree search kind of planner in your graph. Uh, it's hard to backpropagate through it. Uh, but uh, it's not clear like which one would win. But I guess for continuous control tasks, it's it's just very natural to uh, search in the embedding space. So it may be natural, natural, but one would presume it's not adequate because you're only going to find local solutions. And to plan, you have to consider multiple possibilities. You have to search. Anyway, that's how it seems to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
I just wanted to ask very quickly, um, how do you choose the size of the state space of the model? Uh, I think we have like a 128 dimensional uh, latent space. Uh, it's not, we didn't really search uh, for hyperparameters there, yeah. so whatever we tried for us worked. Because it, it could be possible that your reward doesn't need you to model all these states. Yeah, so uh, yeah. If, if you had more latent variables than necessary, then uh, it's just going to ignore what's unnecessary. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And we're going to immediately start with the next session. Our first speaker is uh, Ronan Fruit, and he's going to talk about efficient bias constraint exploration exploitation in RL. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Ronan, and uh, as was said, uh, I will talk about efficient bias constraint exploration exploitation in reinforcement learning. So let's get started. Uh, before describing the technical details of this work, I will start with a very uh, simple illustrative example. So let's consider this simple domain where there is an agent uh, located at the bottom of a mountain, and we will further assume that the, the agent has already explored uh, the valley around the mountain. And so it already knows where to find apples uh, at the bottom of the mountain. What it doesn't know, however, is uh, what is located at the top of the mountain. And there are basically two cases. Either there is nothing really interesting, or maybe there are raspberries. And here I will assume that the agent prefers raspberries to apples. So this is a very simple example, but this is a perfect illustration of the exploration exploitation trade-off in reinforcement learning. Namely, the agent has the choice between exploiting the local reward that is already known and explored, so the apple in this case, and exploring uh, a known region, like the top of the mountain, with the goal of finding a better reward, so the raspberry in this case. And uh, a technique that is known to be efficient to efficiently solve this exploration exploitation dilemma is optimism in the face of uncertainty. So what optimism does is basically to assume the best possible world. So in this case, to assume that there are indeed raspberries at the top of the mountain. And this way, it pushes for just the right amount of exploration needed to achieve good performance. So what is challenging in this, uh, one thing that is challenging in this uh, very simple example is the fact that the agent doesn't know in advance the altitude of the mountain. So of course, the higher the mountain, the more challenging the exploration because the agent has to climb. Uh, and this is somehow an intrinsic difficulty of reinforcement learning or reinforcement learning problems, and it will be in general unavoidable, except if we can exploit some prior knowledge. And so, for example, in this case, the agent could use the fact that raspberries do not grow uh, above a certain altitude. Uh, and this way, it would avoid exploring too far from the current position that is already known, which is the, the, the bottom of the mountain. Um, so this very simple example gives you a high-level overview of the main contribution of this work, which is basically to show how to incorporate this type of prior knowledge into reinforcement learning algorithm in order to achieve a better exploration exploitation trade-off and so better performance. And I must uh, mention that uh, this problem has been an open problem in the literature since uh, 2009 and the work of Bartlett and Tewari with Regalcy. Okay, so now let's try to be a bit more formal. So we'll consider a finite MDP, meaning that both the state, sorry, the state space S and the action space A are finite. And we, and uh, so I will denote by P the transition probabilities and R the reward function. That is assumed to be bounded between zero and one. So we will assume that P and R are unknown uh, and we consider a non-line learning problem, meaning that uh, the agent collects data sequentially and will adapt his behavior uh, accordingly in an online fashion. And the goal of the agent is to learn the optimal policy which maps uh, states to distribution of reactions. But what do I mean by optimal? So here we will consider uh, the long-term average optimality criterion, also called the gain. So for a given policy pi, uh, the gain is the expected asymptotic per step reward that the agent will earn when executing, playing this policy. Uh, and uh, an optimal policy is a policy that is maximizing the gain, okay? An important property is the fact that the, the optimal gain is state independent. Okay, uh, and then there's another uh, concept that we will need, uh, which is the notion of bias. 
So for a given policy, the bias is the expected cumulative difference between the immediate reward that you get at MT and the gain. Uh, so if you want a high-level interpretation, the gain can be interpreted as the asymptotic stationary reward, whereas the bias is the uh, transient reward of a policy. And the optimal bias is simply the bias, what I call optimal bias, is the bias of the optimal policy. Okay, so at this point, if you are not familiar with this uh, setting, you might be wondering how to interpret all the terms. So let me come back to the initial example. So let's assume that there are raspberries at the top of the mountain. So the optimal policy is simply to uh, climb the mountain and then eat the preferred fruit, which is raspberries in this case. Uh, now let's define two states, S1, the bottom of the mountain, and S2, the top of the mountain. So here, uh, we kind of see why the optimal gain is state independent, because no matter where the agent starts, it will end up eating raspberries. And so the long-term uh, optimal behavior is the same no matter the starting state. But we see that starting from S1 is somehow more costly than starting from S2 because we have to climb the, the mountain. And so this is quantified by the difference, the difference in optimal bias uh, between S2 and S1. So now we'll introduce a new quantity, which is the span of the optimal bias which corresponds to the maximal difference between any two values of the optimal bias. And so here you can interpret the span of H star as the altitude of the mountain. And in general, in uh, all uh, reinforcement learning domains, it will quantify, it will be an upper bound on the cost that you pay for reaching the long-term optimal behavior. And so the prior knowledge that I was talking about in the introduction, uh, I will assume that it's simply a, constant, a positive constant C this is an upper bound on the span of H star, and that is known to the agent. And so here we can interpret it as the maximum altitude where raspberries can grow. Okay, so we consider a learning problem, meaning that we have to assess the performance of the learning agent. And so here I will consider the notion of regret, which corresponds to the cumulative difference between the optimal gain, so the red curve here, and the immediate reward, the blue curve. So the regret is the area between the two curves. So in introduction, I've briefly mentioned the concept of optimism in the face of uncertainty, and now let me describe a state-of-the-art algorithm, uh, UCRL, introduced in 2010, that implements this principle. So what uh, UCRL does is basically, after getting new observations, it does two things. The, the first thing it does is to construct a set of plausible MDPs, uh, so calligraphic MT at time T, that is uh, based on the past history, HT. Uh, usually, usually this is done using maximum likelihood estimators and, um, and uh, 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 confidence, uh, high probability confidence bounds. And then the second thing is to compute an optimistic policy, pi t. But what do I mean by optimistic policy? So mathematically, it corresponds to solving the, the following uh, problem, optimization problem. So MT here is the MDP in the set of plausible MDPs that I introduced uh, that has the highest optimal gain. And pi t is simply the optimal policy of MT. But how is it possible to solve this optimization problem that seems to be uh, rather difficult? Fortunately, uh, there is an equivalent formulation which consists in simply finding the optimal policy of a slightly different MDP, which has the same state space, but a different action space. So the action space is, uh, is richer somehow. There are more actions than in the original MDP. And we call it the extended action space and the, the corresponding MDP, the extended MDP. Okay, and what we want to do is to incorporate the prior knowledge on the optimal uh, bias span into the, the algorithm, and so into this optimization problem. So this is what we do in our approach called SCAL, for Span Constraint Algorithm. And uh, what we do is we consider a very similar optimization problem, so the same set uh, we optimize over the same set of plausible MDPs, but we will uh, restrict the policy space and we consider policies that, uh, that, are, that have a bias span that is bounded by C, which is exactly what we want to do. Okay, and uh, similarly to UCRL, we can find an equivalent formulation, which is basically to find the policy in the same extended MDP that achieves maximal gain, but under the constraint, so slightly different. Okay, how do we solve these two problems? So in the case of UCRL, it's uh, rather simple because we want to find the optimal policy of an MDP. So we can use value iteration. So we iteratively apply the Bellman operator. 
But here, the maximum of actions is not taken over the initial set of actions, so the true action space of the true MDP, but over the extended action space. So we know that we will converge. And a nice uh, property is the fact that the greedy policy associated to the one-step operator uh, is, uh, can always be chosen to be deterministic. It always exists. So our uh, algorithm, so to solve the same problem but with the constraint on the span, is a slight modi modification of the um, of value iteration. We call it scope for span constraint optimization. But so after uh, applying the Bellman operator, what we do is we check whether the constraint on the, s on the span of the value function Vn, Vn plus one, is satisfied. So if the span is bounded by C. If not, basically we truncate uh, the, the value, the vector, to ensure that for all n, span of Vn is bounded by C. Okay, uh, so one first uh, remark is the fact that uh, the policy associated to the one-step operator, this time, cannot always be chosen deterministic. Sometimes you have to pick it stochastic. So this is not a major issue. But what is, the, is a major issue, however, is the fact that this policy might not even exist at all. And even worse, the algorithm may not even converge. Uh, so this is a main problem. So how did we overcome these two limitations? So our proposed solution is basically to alter the extended MDP. Uh, MTLT. So the first thing that we did is to perturb the uh, transition probability. So what did we decide to do this? Well, this is to solve the problem of convergence of the algorithm. We wanted to have an operator that is contractive. And if you want an analogy, think of the discounted setting in reinforcement learning. When you have a discount factor gamma, one minus gamma can be interpreted as the probability to reach an absorbing state with reward zero. And so uh, here what we, did, what we do is we perturb the transition uh, kernel by forcing that for any state action, uh, the transition to S bar is uh, at least eta, with an eta positive constant. Um, so with this modification, we ensure convergence. The problem is the existence of the associative policy. Um, so what we did uh, to ensure this existence is we extended the set of plausible MDP, so the extended MDP by duplicating all actions. Uh, more precisely, for every action, we create an associated uh, action uh, that has uh, the, with the transition probability unchanged, but the reward is set to zero. And this way, we ensure existence. So to summarize, uh, when we apply both the perturbation and the augmentation, we ensure that our algorithm scope converges. Of course, there is a small bias introduced due to the fact that we perturb the transition uh, probabilities but the bias is uh, not bigger than eta c, and c is known, and so we can tune eta to be sufficiently small to avoid too big bias. Okay, uh, what are the theoretical guarantees for our algorithm? So for SCAL, the learning algorithm, uh, we have a regret uh, that scales with probability one minus, des one minus delta, sorry, as s square root of a t times the minimum between our prior knowledge c and the diameter of the MDP d. So what is the diameter? It's basically the shortest distance between any two states in the MDP that are the most distant from each other. So if you take an eight by eight grid, here uh, you have um, that the states that are the most distant are two states that are in opposite corners. Uh, and the shortest distance is basically 14 in this case, so it's the blue path that is plotted here. And in comparison, the regret of UCRL, so state of the art, will scale with D, just the diameter. So we get always something that is better. But how good is this improvement? Well, it turns out that Bartlett and Terry proved that the span of H star uh, is always bounded by D. So this is something good uh, for us. Uh, but not only that, but also the gap between D and the span of H star can be arbitrarily big. More precisely, there exist MDPs where the diameter is infinite, whereas the span of H star, by definition, is always finite. So the improvement can be uh, quite big for some uh, domains. Okay, so uh, now we'll present uh, experiments that validate the theoretical findings. So the goal is to consider an MDP where the diameter is big, so that UCRL performs very badly. So here it's 250 whereas the span of H star is very small, so 3.28. And so we have a huge margin of improvement. Uh, so uh, basically the, the example is, uh, the domain is a grid word where the agent 
um, has to uh, unlock the door on the top left corner. And to do this, he has to buy a key at the shop. And before that, he needs gold, and so he needs to mine gold. Um, and uh, the challenge is uh, basically that there is a dragon in front of the door, so he has to uh, avoid the dragon. Uh, and to do that, he can just wait that the dragon moves in a different cell, or he can buy the, um, the shield. But buying the shield is not optimal because it's quite expensive, quite costly. So that's why the, and it takes time, so that's why the diameter is big. Uh, whereas the agent can just wait for the dragon to move. Uh, and so that's why the span of H star is very small. So this is the, the, res the, the, the regret that we get. So uh, the Y axis is the regret, so it means that the lower the better. And the X axis is uh, duration, so it's time, T. So this is what we get for UCRL. Now if we use uh, our algorithm with a prior knowledge C equal 10, uh, we get a much better regret. And with a better uh, prior knowledge, C equals 5, we get an even uh, better regret. Uh, so the more we find the prior knowledge, the better, as expected from theory. OK, uh, now uh, let me conclude. So basically, uh, the, this work um, uh, is solving an open question uh, uh, opened by Barthlet and Tewari in 2009, so with the work on Regal C. Uh, it can be extended to other approaches like posterior sampling uh, instead of optimism in the face of uncertainty. And the typical example where the diameter is uh, infinite is uh, our MDPs where the state space is continuous. And so in this case, uh, all uh, algorithms that achieve the theory, good theoretical guarantees needs this kind of prior knowledge, so our algorithm could be, uh, could be used. Thank you for your attention, and you can come at our poster. It's number 91, and I'm happy to, to take questions. Hi. A um, couple things I want to make sure I understood. So the span was basically the difference in the value, like the maximum difference in the value of different states? Yes. OK. And yeah, so I think, yeah, it makes sense that this is like can substitute in a sense for the um, the diameter. That's cool. I was wondering if this is um, if you're assuming that this span is in fact um, bounded by something, or if you're sort of saying we're only going to look for something that uh, so like if if the, if you can apply this in in general and then say like well we're we're going to get like close enough to uh, No, no, so, so here what we assume is that the agent knows the, I mean, that we know the algorithm knows an upper bound on the, on the optimal bias span. So it's not something, it's not an arbitrarily close upper bound on the span of H star. So you need to know this to run the algorithm because you need it to basically solve the optimization problem where you, you need this constant to truncate your value function at every time steps. Okay. So yeah, yeah, this is a kind of this is a form of prior knowledge uh, that, yeah. you, that you need. Uh, but uh, I don't know if this was your question. But basically, I mean, this quantity is always uh, finite for all. I mean, finite MDPs. So we know that right. you know, there exists an upper bound. Okay. Um, so I had another question about the um, the augmentation. Mm -hmm. So I think you give a good uh, intuition for the I forget what it was called the other uh, yeah the perturbation the point before yeah, but yeah. the augmentation I didn't really understand yeah, what so, this was doing. Uh, I mean, basically, this is a bit um, technical, so maybe we can take this offline if you That's want fine, to, yeah. to do the poster because it's a bit technical sure. to explain. All right, yeah. thanks. Sorry. Hello, thanks for the Hi. talk. Um, when you say your method is efficient, uh, what, what do you mean? What, what, what is the scale with her? What do you mean by that? Um, so, so here I mean efficient in terms of uh, so exploration, exploitation, uh, trade-off. So good regret guarantees. I don't know if this is answering the question. Okay, let's uh, thank Ronan again. And our next speaker, if we can actually connect this laptop, is uh, Yin Lam Chow, and he's going to talk about path consistency learning in Salis entropy regularized MDPs.
Yeah, so thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, hi everyone, this is Yinan Chao, and I'm going to talk about our work about path consistency learning in SALUS entropy regularized MDPs. So this is a joint collaboration with uh, Ophir Nakum from Google Brain, myself, and Mohamed Gwafamzadeh and Rebo from DeepMind. So to start with the presentations, let's uh, consider the background of a Markov decision process and just a standard RL problem of maximizing return. So as we know from principle of optimality, that the optimal value function is a fixed point of the Bellman equation. So while this is all standard, I want to stress that when we try to solve V star, let's say through dynamic programming algorithms, we got to, in the general case, unless you specified function approximations for V star or something about the transition functions, you got to solve the max operator explicitly. And this might kind of be expensive if we have, let's say, a discrete action set with a lot of elements. And also in this case, solving V star involves solving a system of linear, nonlinear equations. Furthermore, we get our optimal policy mu star through this way. The corresponding mu star is going to be deterministic. It is unclear for us how to do explorations with these problem formulations beyond planning when we go to RL. So there are many different ways of imposing explorations. As we can also see from uh, the previous speakers, there are many also other ways. So in this talk, we are going to focus on one remedy, which instead of considering the original MDP problem, we want to explicitly study the entropy regularized MDP problem, which we are trying to introduce this H mu, which is an entropy regularized reward function. And we want to say that this reward function has two benefits. One is by specifying this H mu, it provides exploration incentive. And the second one is by specifying also H mu, we can actually get close from optimal policies instead of explicitly solving the max operator. So this really helps when we have a discrete set of actions, especially. So in this talk, we are explicitly going to focus on two types of ERMDPs. One is so-called the Shannon ERMDPs, which the H mu is uh, induced by the Shannon entropy, which this is a very classic and standard way of uh, putting entropy regularizations to induce exploration. And the second one is what we so-called Salas ERMDP, which is an increasingly popular way of doing entropy regularization using the so-called Salas entropy. And Salas entropy is a member of an F-divergence functions. There are more technical details, but we will leave it in the poster sessions to talk more about it. So to first start with, we want to discuss the optimality conditions and compare about it. So this is the table that uh, summarize the properties between these two entropy functions. And in this talk, we're also going to call the Shannon entropy policy, the, in, po the policy induced from the Shannon ERMDP as soft policies versus the policy introduced by the Salas ERMDP as a sparse policy. So while there are lots of technical details, I would say the main takeaway is the soft policy that we solve from the Shannon ERMDP is going to be having a soft max formulation, while the Salas entropy is going to introduce this threshold-based optimal policy class. And with more further details, in this threshold-based policies, the cutoff is going to be controlled by the value function alpha dynamically. So you can think of these threshold policies. The cutoff is going to be controlled by how the optimal functions behave. And furthermore, some other interpretation, mathematical interpretation, is that this threshold policy is like a projection of the value functions onto a set of simplex, an L2 projection. So while all these uh, formulations close from solutions of the value functions and policy does, sounds, uh, does looks complicated, they are actually differentiable and people have also shown it in multiple places. And for more technical details, again, please refer it to our paper. And this really uh, is an advantage for us also that we can leverage current techniques in backprop that has been widely used in the deep learning community for us to effectively compute all these optimal values and policies ex even in the space of large actions and high dimensional states. So as a comparison, as we can see, if we go back to the original, MDP formulations, the max operator there is indeed non-differentiable. So this actually buys us something more. 
So besides just the optimality conditions, I want to talk about the suboptimality performance between the soft and the sparse policies. Uh, <clears throat> specifically, for the performance of the soft policies, the suboptimality performance gap, which is the value function induced by these soft policies and the optimal value functions, is upper bound, is bounded by this term alpha delivered, one minus gamma log alpha, uh, log of the size of the action space. While the first term depends on the temperature and the discount factor, the second term really depends on the action space size. And as you can see, if we consider the size of large, if the size of the action space is large, our suboptimality gap becomes unbounded. Versus in the sparse case, this suboptimality gap is actually controlled by besides the first term, the second term that is a fraction of the size of the action space that converges to one half, even when the space blows up. So this really motivates one of the use of Salas entropy because especially in the case of large action space, <clears throat> in Shannon entropy, things start to degrade. While Shannon entropy balance performance and, performance and exploration well in small action space problems, as we can see in many off the shelf RL algorithms, in the large action space, it behaves poorly. One of the main reasons is that because of the softmax policy class, it tends to introduce non-zero probabilities to every non-optimal actions. This can somehow be alleviated by tuning the temperature parameter, but somehow annealing this term during exploration phase or training phase becomes uh, non-trivial. On the other hand, when you look at the Salas ERMDP that returns this threshold-based policy class, this threshold-based policy class provides a clean cutoff to all the non-optimal actions. So even think of the extreme case if some of the non-optimal actions are unsafe. So if you don't have a clean cutoff just like what softmax policies, unless you have a very extreme value of alpha, you really cannot prevent the policies to have a non-zero non probability of visiting those dangerous actions. And in other words, this actually gives us indicates that the Salas ERMDP can have a more safer exploration because of this clean cutoff. And as we can also see before, it has a better suboptimality performance with large action space. And furthermore, in some engineering applications, especially the ones in energy systems, for example, battery charging problems, it is more explainable by using threshold bait policies, especially to basically when the Q star of SP depends on the battery level. So with all these uh, various comparisons, we also want to talk about the consistency conditions of these two uh, Shannon ERMDP and Salas ERMDP. And we want to stress our contributions is on deriving the consistency conditions for the Salas case. But first to talk, to introduce about the consistency conditions, we want to first revisit the soft consistency that Ophir did in his previous NIPS paper. And we want to try to stress the importance of consistency equations later when we talk about path consistency learning. So consider a pair of value functions and policy that satisfies these Bellman-like equations or the consistency conditions for any state and actions. So because these consistency conditions was derived based on some KKT conditions of the Bellman optimality, Ophir actually showed in this paper that if we solve for a pair of solutions from the consistency conditions, it is indeed equivalent to saying that these solutions are optimal corresponding to the Shannon ERMDP. This is one uh, good result saying that without loss of optimality, we can actually solve optimal policies through the equations of consistency. And the other good part of using consistency condition is we can easily extend the first, the one step consistency conditions to a multi-step counterpart, which needs to be hold for any initial states and any action trajectories. Uh, <clears throat> because here, all these consistency equations are independent of the sampling distributions of the policy. So later we can see that how we can utilize this multi-step counterpart to derive off-policy RL algorithms that not only takes state action next states pair, but we can actually use it through off-policy trajectories. So as, uh, as I discussed before, in our work, we mainly derive uh, sparse consistency conditions, which similar to the soft one, we consider the pair of 
value functions and policy that satisfies the following consistency equations for any state and actions. But one technical difficulty here compared to the soft version is that here we have explicit slack variables that are the Lagrange multipliers in the KKT conditions, and they need to satisfy these two explicit constraints. Similar to the soft counterpart, we can easily also get theoretical results for the sparse consistency, which the first part is when you get the optimal policies from the ER MDPs. They are also the consistent. They are also the solutions to the consistency conditions, which we say here is optimality implies consistency. On the other hand, if you get solutions from the consistency equations, they are also near optimal with this certain bound. This bound is also uh, nice because when A goes to infinity, this is still bounded. And while even you have this extra suboptimality gap combined with the previous one in the sparse case, it is still a bounded suboptimality constant as compared to the blowing up version in the soft case. So as similar to the soft consistency version, we can also extend the one-step consistency to multi-step, which again allows us to do off-policy RL algorithms later that depends on off-policy trajectories. So having, uh, in to in after introducing all these theoretical conditions between Salas ER MDP, we want to move towards path consistency learning. So as previously in many value-based reinforcement learning methods, such as DQN, in order to improve sample complexity, we usually sample off policy state action next states from a replay buffer and try to minimize some sort of Bellman residual. This is nice, but we, we somehow ignore the temporal dependencies for other trajectories because all we want to sample here is state action next state samples. So while, as you can see before, in the multi-step consistency conditions, it needs to be hold for any initial state and action trajectories, and it is independent of the policy sampled fr uh, through this trajectory. Then this basically allows us to design PCL algorithms that minimize consistency error and utilize off-policy trajectories. One example is this parse PCL algorithm, and as I said, it is basically minimizing the consistency error. We do have a couple of technical details on how to massage the Lagrange multiplier constraints and how to basically introduce uh, like a better parameterizations without loss of optimality, but I would defer the technical details to the poster. And furthermore, in the stochastic plus PCL case, similar to Bellman residual minimizations, the empirical version is actually biased. And we do have either, the fan we either use double sampling, which, in which can be impractical in many real-world situations, or we can also employ the fan trial trick similar to the speed algorithm from Lee Hong's group recently to transform this problem into a settle point problem. So to wrap up the talk here, I would uh, like to talk about two experiments that we perform on Mojoko domains. The first one is the Mojoko environment that uh, is on the algorithmic benchmarks. So here, the blue one corresponds to the soft PCL solutions, which is a soft policies, and the green one corresponds to the parse PCL solutions, which we call the sparse policies. Clearly, when the action space are small, the soft policies perform pretty well because of the easier to learn, uh, less parameters, and also the functions are relatively more differentiable and smooth. But once the action space blows up, you can see the degradations happen for the soft policies while the sparse policies are quite stable and their performance catch up. This phenomenon becomes more pronounced and significant when we look at the second example, which we discretize the actions of half cheetah. So here, you can see that sparse PCL quickly uh, converge to a deterministic solutions, which is the policies for this deterministic half cheetah domain, while uh, the soft policy still struggles in, during the exploration phase. And you can see this also results in a pretty big performance uh, difference. So to sum up, in this talk, we talk about the uh, ERMDP through Salas entropy and, uh, and Shannon entropy. And we also try to compare them in terms of differentiability, safe exploration, and interpretability. Furthermore, we also talk about the consistency conditions and how we can develop sparse PCL algorithms for that. And finally, we showed empirically the effectiveness of these sparse PCL algorithms through large action space. So this is the end of the talk. 
uh, thank you. So if you have any more questions, please let us know, and also the more technical details, we can talk about it during the posters. So, thanks. Okay, so we have time for a bunch of questions. Good. Blown away by equations. Okay, um, so how would you extend this to continuous actions? So I would say for the soft, I would say for the soft case, it is like having some inherent dependency, uh, inherent relationship with Gaussian-based policies. Mm -hmm. But for Salas entropy, this is actually a good point that we are currently working on. Besides, like, just throwing more deep nets to, uh, like, numerically advancing it. Currently, we don't have like a good parameterization, like a closed form parameterization in the continuous case. And the uh, the guarantees, but the guarantees should, yeah. This part is also, I would say, is a future work that we haven't been able to extend fully to continuous action space. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Th thank you for the nice talk. Stay, stay, stay. I'm a little curious <laughs> about the whole idea of entropy reg regularization. Okay. It mm -hmm. seems like uh, uh, it would lead to the agent preferring states where it didn't matter what it did. And it might uh, it, that it would, uh, which which is which is odd. You don't seem to be exploring in, in the states. You're you're well. You're preferring states where you can just behave uh, randomly. And uh, so, if you had two possible uh, policies, two ways of being, one which which may have the same rewards, but if one allowed you to do many things, you would prefer it. I was yeah. just curious about that. Am I right that in my understanding of the effect of the entropy regularization? I should just turn that into a question. I hope you all notice that. Thank you. So, yeah, I do agree that in certain extent just introducing entropy regularizations does not take into account the environment on how to do explorations using local informations. But still, this is kind of like an information constant that allows us to Instead of taking greedy actions all the time, you allow basically gathering more information. This is basically how the entropy constants behave. And between Shannon and Salas, this is basically a trade-off between a sparse approximation or a soft approximation. So, but I still think it's an interesting point to, if we can put more environmental type information to the entropy regularization design. But so far, like I do agree that with just these two regularizations, we cannot do that, so. Okay. okay. That was the fa that was the fastest connection we had for <coughs> all, of, all of today. So our next talk is by Mark Bay on improved regret bounds for Thompson sampling in linear quadratic control problems. Okay, thanks for the introduction. So it's a joint work with uh, Alessandro Lazaric. So let's uh, jump in. So in this work, we considered uh, the standard one trajectory reinforcement learning problem where we have an agent who has to interact sequentially with an unknown environment in order to accumulate as much reward as possible. And to do so, to solve the problem, we have several difficulties that needs to be addressed. And starting with the standard finite state and action space setting, what we have to do is to both solve the planning problem, that is how to, given a transition model, compute the optimal policy to maximize the cumulative reward. And since the true transition model is unknown, we also have to face the learning problem, that is, given transition observed so far on the trajectory, how to infer this unknown transition model. So in the finite state action space, we know how to do both, but this has to be performed jointly, and so we face the well-known exploration exploitation dilemma. But we have strategy to address it, so either relying on optimism, we've seen the UCRL in the previous talk, or on randomness, I mean, uh, Thompson sampling in particular. Uh, and for both of those algorithms, we have theoretical guarantee for the performance. So that's the good news. But the drawback is that in practice, uh, in many situations, the state action space is very large, or even infinite if we have uh, continuous uh, variables, and thus the, the theoretical guarantee that we have become vacuous. So that's uh, the main objective here is to go for a continuous state in action, so continuous RL, 
And uh, a very natural idea is to, okay, have continuous uh, states and actions, but a parameterized dynamic. So in general, well, we can still say things about the learning because we can leverage what we know about uh, time series analysis, but how to solve the planning problem gets uh, very difficult or uh, untractable. And, and in particular, we don't know how to say anything about the exploration expectation uh, and in particular at the theoretical level. So what we do in this work is that we go for a continuous state and action, but we consider a very specific instance of parameterized system that is the linear quadratic regulator. And uh, what we do is that we prove the first square root of t uh, regret bound uh, for the uh, Thomson sampling algorithm that is a very computational way of uh, addressing the exploration exploitation, computationally efficient way of addressing the exploration exploitation. Okay, so let's go for more details. So in the, the LQ setting, we have so a continuous state xt, a continuous control ut, but we impose a lot of structure on the, the structure of the transition model, and basically the next state, xt plus one, is a linear combination of the current state and control and an unknown parameter t tester. So as opposed to uh, trying to maximize in rewards, uh, as for UCRL, we try to minimize costs, but it works exactly the same way. And we assume that the costs are quadratic in the state and control, involving two known matrices Q and R. So the only unknown part in the system is isolated in the dynamic. And uh, the, the overall objective is to find a policy mapping states to control in order to minimize this infinite horizon average cost, which is the measure of cost we consider over a trajectory. Okay, so what's the good news about the, the, the this LQ framework is that uh, in this case, as opposed to a uh, parameterized system in general, we do know how to solve the planning. And the LQ theory tells us that the optimal policy is linear in the state, and not only it's linear, but we can compute it efficiently by solving a Riccati equation. So for any theta that parameterizes the dynamic, we can compute the optimal policy. It's simply a control matrix K of theta times the state, and if one follows this uh, optimal policy, he would uh, suffer an optimal average cost that we denote as J of theta. So we know how to solve the planning problem, but we also know how to solve the learning problem because now that the dynamic is linear, we can rely on least square estimates. And so in a very standard fashion, if we collect in a variable ZT, the current state and control, the dynamic is linear in ZT, and given sample loops of so far, we can compute the regularized least square estimate theta hat. So we know how to do the planning, we know how to do the learning, and now we only have to say anything about the uh, exploration exploitation strategy. So it's at a very high level, it uh, goes this way. So at each time step, you have to select a policy that is not just a control matrix, KT, based on the, what, we know, what you know about the system. And the objective is to minimize the cost of the trajectory, or equivalently, is to minimize the regrets. And here, the regret is the difference between the cost that we suffer by following this sequence of policies, KT, and the optimal average cost that we would have suffered by following the unknown true optimal policy k star. And uh, so the objective of this work is to provide some theoretical guarantee for the regrets suffered by the Thompson sampling algorithm. And so this is what we, we would like to target. So we have Bayesian regret guarantee of all the square root of t, but unfortunately it doesn't provide the performance guarantee for a specific realization of theta star, but only on average with respect to a prior. And we want to target the stronger guarantee that is the frequentist regret. And uh, we want to match a uh, square root of t uh, rate, uh, which is the guarantee that we have for the optimism in face of uncertainty algorithm. Okay, so what's the, the Thomson sampling algorithm that we have? So it's quite simple. It consists at each time step into sampling a, a parameter theta tilde based on the knowledge that you acquired, but on the basis of your uncertainty in order to promote exploration. And once this parameter has been sampled, just compute thanks to Riccati equation the optimal policy associated to this. Follow this policy, suffer a cost, observe the next state, which allows you to update the knowledge that you have, and so on and so forth. So there is one uh, important comment to say about the, this uh, algorithm, is that here we consider a very vanilla instance of Thomson sampling, and uh, this is really look like the one we use for linear bandits, apart from the way we compute the control. And this is in sharp contrast with uh, how Thomson sampling is usually implemented in other MDP application, because usually a lot of structure or a bit of structure have to be added on the top of this simple protocol to make it work. And in particular here, we don't do any episodic scheme in order to control the update of the policy. And we do update the policy at each time step. And we will see that it's going to be critical for the analysis. Okay, so what we showed is that following this, this Thompson sampling instance, uh, if run over t step, it suffers at most a regret that is of the square root of t. So it's an improvement over the previous uh, result that we had. Uh, and it matches the, the optimal square root of t rate that we have for OFU and matches the same guarantee as the Bayesian regret, but for a stronger criterion. 
So the, the only limitation is that, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, limited to one-dimensional system so far, mainly because of technical difficulties. So let me uh, give you a brief overview of how we derive such results. So it all starts with the, the regret decomposition, so it's now quite standard in this kind of analysis, where uh, we use the Bellman equation to decompose the regret into a bunch of terms that we treat separately. And here, I'm not even going to mention the, the, the last two because generically, by applying previous lines of proof, we can bound them by square root of t. And all the challenge lies in bounding the first two terms that are RTS and R gap. So, Simplifying a bit the expression um, uh, in the one-dimensional case, what we have is to say anything about uh, RTS, that is the deviation in the optimal average cost due to randomness, and our gap, that is the difference between the optimal average cost taken in two subsequent sampling parameters. So what was done before, in, in order to bond our gap, the second term, was to say, oh, each time we update a policy, where well, we can bound this difference by a fixed quantity, so we can say roughly that we suffer a fixed cost at each policy update. And this speaks in favor of rarely updating the policy. So this is what is illustrated on the, the picture on the right-hand side, where on the x-axis you have the number of policy updates, and on the y-axis you have the regrets. And so, sticking with this previous line of proof, the regret or gap scales linearly with the number of updates. So it speaks in favor of rarely updating. But on the other hand, if we look at RTS, the way we manage to bound it is to say, leveraging what we know in the linear bandit case, uh, we need a frequent optimistic sampling to show that uh, this regret term gets bounded. And uh, in, in there, there is two things hidden. So first, that we need a fixed probability of being optimistic at each time step. And then that we do frequent, frequent updates in order to capture this probability. And so the regret term RTS decreases with the number of times we update the policy. This is in opposition with the way we bond our gap, and so the best trade-off that one can get is t to the two-third. So how to overcome this? Well, by noticing that it's not true that we suffer a fixed cost each time we update a policy. In practice, the sampling distribution that we use are slowly varying, and so distribution at time t is very close to distribution at time t plus one. And thus, this induces smooth policy update, and as a result, the regret term or gap can be well controlled even though we update the policy at each time step. And this allows us to, to show that the regret in the end in this frequent update uh, Thompson sampling is of order square root of t. So the key message here is, is that not only we can update at each time step, but we have to if we want to keep the first regret term and the overall regret well controlled. So thanks for your attention. Of course, there are more to say, but uh, please pass by the poster if uh, you want more details. Okay, so I actually have a quick question. So the theta parameters are the model parameters, so the A and V matrices, yep. and the V was the value function? So the or V on the, on the, on the first slides? Uh, so yeah, uh, where you sample through the Thompson uh, the, the parameter sampling, what, what was that V? That was so the, the precision the, was matrix. It's, it's the design matrix of the regression, of the least squares. Uh, okay, so okay, so you you sample you sample these parameters, but effectively this is a, a prior on the on the parameters, right? So you have a Bayesian regression, a linear regression model, uh, if you think about it this way. And then the question is, why don't you just integrate these parameters out? I mean, you get closed form solutions. So uh, just one, one, one comment. So uh, even though it's the same structure as what we would get with a prior uh, posterior update, here it's really, um, it's really a frequentist approach. So it can be understood as a perturbed uh, randomized algorithm. So we don't, we don't rely on any prior posterior assumption. And uh, so I don't really know how to integrate this. Uh, so of course, this quantity matters a lot in the, in the analysis. And it really has to be you know, this inverse design matrix that encodes the uncertainty that we have over the estimation. But uh, by sampling it, it's the way we integrate it uh, in the algorithm. Okay, shall we swap? Okay, so if there are no more questions, then uh, thank you very much. Thanks.
right, and, sorry, and the, the last talk for today is uh, by uh, Stephen Tu on least squares temporal difference learning for the LQR. Thank you. All right. Thank you. OK, last talk of the day. So let's do this. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my work on LSTD for LQR. So before I kind of get into the details, I want to give a high-level high sketch of the research that you know, I've been focusing on for the last couple of years. Uh, the idea is that there's been a lot of applications of reinforcement learning in these continuous control tasks. I want to emphasize, emphasize continuous here. So application of this, you know, we've seen things like the, the locomotion tasks and the Mujoku uh, OpenAI benchmarks. But we also see these things being applied in the real you know, physical world, as in uh, self-driving cars, personalized robotics, you know, grasping tasks, and unmanned aerial, vehicle, unmanned aerial vehicles. And because these systems interact with the, you know, the real physical environment uh, and not just in a simulator, the kind of things that we would like to ask are, you know, do we have any guarantees on performance and safety uh, in these situations, right? Like, we want these systems to interact safely outside of the lab environment, and we want to have proofs that is, things aren't going to go awry. So it's a very difficult question to like fully, you know, it's, it's, it's a very ambitious question to try to answer. And the way that we've been tackling that is to study baselines, right? To study something that we, where we actually know what to do if we knew all the dynamics, and then see what happens if we apply machine learning. And it's great that the previous talk came before me because, uh, you know, we've, I guess, already seen LQR once, so I'm just going to go briefly through what LQR is again. So we're going to focus on the case where we have these linear dynamics. So A and B is going to parameterize the uh, dynamics of the system. And the cost is going to be parameterized by two quadratic matrices Q and R. And here I'm considering the discounted version of this problem. If you remember from the previous talk, that they were considering the average time version of this problem. Uh, you know, there's kind of maybe slight technical differences, but roughly they're basically the same. And in particular, when A and B are known, when the dynamics are known, you solve roughly the same Riccati equation, and you get out a linear feedback law. And that's proof that you can, this is actually provably optimal for this problem, right? You don't need anything more uh, you know, uh, expressive than a linear feedback law, right? So if I have an A, B, I know exactly what to do. So now the question is, what, what, what do we do when the dynamics are not known? Uh, uh, so, you know, we can't plug it in and solve for this Riccati equation anymore because we don't have the inputs. So, you know, there's model-free, model-based methods. I mean, there's model-based methods, model-free methods. In this talk, I'm going to look at model-free, and in particular, I'm going to look at least squares temporal differencing, right? And the particular sub-problem that I'm going to look at is we're going to study policy evaluation via temporal differences. So what is policy evaluation is you hand me a controller K, right? You got it somehow. And uh, you want to know what its value function is, how, how good is this controller, right? And this problem is, uh, this problem of, uh, of the using LSTD to solve this problem was first proposed by Brad Key in 96 in his PhD thesis, and he looked at this problem asymptotically. And so for, for this talk, or for this paper, or for this work, we want to look at non-asymptotic guarantees on this, right? Because we want to actually have finite time guarantees of what happens uh, when we run on data. So why is LQR such a good problem for studying LSTD and for studying continuous control? Is because in this case, we know exactly what the value function is. So if you hand me a quadratic, I can tell you that the value function is going to be also a quadratic. Uh, it's parameterized by this form, and the P matrix that parameterizes this uh, value function is solved by uh, solving a, um, a Lyapunov equation. But that those details aren't as important. What's really important is the structure here. So in particular, we can define this nonlinear transformation uh, phi on x. And then after this nonlinear transformation, this value function becomes a linear uh, map. Basically, we, you know, we vectorize the p matrix. And now this is just kind of, uh, you can treat this as another vector. And we're just trying to learn this, you know, these linear weights. So in the RL literature, this is sometimes referred to as the linear architecture assumption. Uh, OK. Right? So why is that, that linear um, parameterization important or useful? So by Bellman's equation, uh, we can basically you know, use this, exploit this linearity and write this nice equation, which suggests that you know, if we look along our trajectory, this actually is basically giving us linear measurements of the value function. 
And so roughly, that's maybe not too surprising, is that we can actually try to fit the linear, uh, we can try to fit the value function, the parameters of the value function, by doing something that looks very similar to least squares. Now there's some slight technical issues that come up because we don't actually know what the expectation is, so we need to sort of adjust this estimator in this funny looking way uh, for, for this matrix that's getting inverted. But roughly speaking, you can just think of it as trying to solve a linear regression problem where we're just getting this you know, observation of the uh, uh, value function, okay? So now the question is, how does this actually perform, right? So this is an estimator. I collect a directory, I plug it in. How good is this estimator going to perform for LQR, right? And in particular, you know, how many samples or how long does the trajectory have to be in order to ensure that my estimate p hat of the value function is within epsilon of the true value function? And we're going to measure the error here in Frobenius norm, um, okay? And if uh, in the case where MDP is bounded, right, so where all the states and actions and rewards are all bounded, uh, there's, a, th there's actually known what the sample complexity looks like. And there's this very nice paper from Lazaric et al. in 2012 uh, that they basically study this question for bounded MDPs, right? But LQR is not an instance of this. In particular, the states, actions, and costs can be arbitrarily large, but with some small probability, but they can still have non-zero probability of you know, being as large as you want, right? So we can't, it's just to, we can't just apply these bounded MTB results right, you know, off the shelf. We have to make you know, some non-trivial modifications to make this go through. Um, and so the, the, main, the main result we, uh, that, that we prove in this work is that as long as n, and n here is the length or the length of the trajectory, as long as it satisfies roughly n squared over epsilon squared, I'll go into more details about the qualitative behavior of this bound uh, in the next slide, but as long as n satisfies this condition, then we have the relative error of the estimate of the value function minus the true value function is within epsilon, right? And so, this is an, so the important thing is this is a non-asymptotic bound. You hand me an epsilon, I tell you this is what n, ne n needs to be. And this holds with high probability. I'm kind of hiding the delta dependence um, in, in this, you know, log one over delta. Okay. Um, so let's interpret this bound a little bit, right? Because it's maybe not the cleanest looking. Uh, so let's think about like what makes estimation more difficult, at least what's suggested by this upper bound. When is it more difficult to learn a value function, right? And so the first thing that happens is when the state dimension grows, right? So it's having this n squared dependence. So it's actually kind of uh, not the greatest. We would maybe hope that it's n, order n, but it's actually n squared. Um, another thing that makes it more difficult is that as system tends to be more unstable or have larger transients, then this bound also blows up. And, 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 and the way it happens is that this P infinity matrix, so if I give you a policy that's actually stabilizing the system, uh, which it, um, has to be to actually have a finite value function, then it induces some stationary distribution and limit, and that covariance matrix is what I'm calling P infinity here. So if you can think of a system where, for instance, is you know, acting more crazy, you can imagine that the covariance might be uh, more ill-conditioned. And as it becomes more and more ill-conditioned, this bound blows up, right? And it's actually kind of pessimistic. It's like kappa to the third. So it suggests that systems that are, you know, perhaps more, or, you know, less well regular, or less well behaved, uh, actually becomes harder to estimate. And finally, we also see that it has this one over one minus gamma squared dependence on the discount factor. Uh, this is actually, I mean, this is fairly standard in RL, so this one is maybe not as, uh, as pessimistic or not as much of an issue. Okay, but that was an upper bound, so uh, it turns out that uh, actually some of these quantities do happen in practice, and sort of characterizing a sharp rate is, is going to be open. But in the, the one minute I have left, I want to basically show a very quick experiment where we actually compare model-based and model-free. So here I'm running the LSPI algorithm, which actually uses the LSTD algorithm that I talked about as a subroutine, right? It basically starts with a policy and it iteratively refines it using LSTD. And that's called LSPI, and that's in the blue. And I'm here, I'm also comparing it with the nominal model, which just estimates the A and B dynamics, and then uses a plug-in estimator to just build a, solve the Riccati equation with the estimated values. And we see here that even though both learn, the model-based method is actually substantially more efficient on this problem than the model-free method. And in particular, after 10,000 time steps of LSPI, it roughly captures the behavior of the nominal-based method only after about 200 or 300 time steps. So in future work, I would actually really like to understand this gap. I would like to sort of prove maybe some lower bounds or sort of characterize, you know, what exactly this gap is for these two different methods, right? And so we can sort of make the experiment there a little bit more rigorous, that would be great. 
And if you want to talk more about the technical detail of this, post session is happening right after this talk. And that's it. OK. Uh, thank you. Um, so a question regarding the, so you're using LSTD, and you said that in order to get those optimal results, you need the rewards uh, and I guess the whole thing to be bounded, right? So we actually have a paper from AAAI this year where we analyzed TD0, and we don't have any assumptions other than second moments. Mm -hmm. So I guess that, that, do you think that that can be uh, leveraged here? Is it, like, why didn't you consider TD0, for instance? Uh, so that's more of like the online version of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. I kind of started there first, but uh, there was some, I, I sort of had an issue getting the proof to go through, and so I kind of stuck with this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I imagine that I will take a look at your paper and we can maybe, yeah, like, we, we should talk because I've actually really wanted to see how that would work as well. Yeah, so. because I don't think there's like anything more to do that can be maybe okay. a plug and play. I didn't know that you can actually linear, I didn't know of that linearized expression, but that's Oh, that's great. Nice maybe, to see. So. Maybe, yeah, maybe that would be an application for your paper. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. great. Awesome. Thanks. Have you tried any of this on a um, nonlinear control task, like a um, model predictive control for nonlinear systems? Uh, I haven't. Um, I've, I've received some emails where someone actually tried to use LSTD on like an inverted pendulum, and he was complaining about how it didn't converge. So, uh, <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't physically do that, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Inverted pendulum is LQR, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I didn't try it on any yeah. nonlinear problems. Thank yes. you. So thanks for the presentation. Uh, so regarding the LSTD, do you have uh, ID assumptions on the data? No, this is, uh, the, I mean, actually, the technical difficulty of the proof is actually dealing with the fact that I'm only taking a single trajectory and actually trying to give the analysis for the single trajectory. Okay, so so the, in that case, do you have, like, assumptions on, like, the mixing time of that trajectory? So basically, we assume that the policy stabilizes the system because that's what it takes to have a well-defined value function. And under that assumption, it's always going to be mixing. And we prove bounds on the mixing rate. And we use, so yes, underlying the, the proof methodology is a mixing time argument, but that's given by, that's just LTI systems always mix if they're stable. Okay, I see. Yeah. yeah. Good to know. Okay, so let's uh, thank Stephen and all the speakers of this session and the previous session for the great presentations and this good piece of work. Thank you.